It's my pleasure tonight to introduce Andre Archie, Associate Professor of Ancient Greek Philosophy at Colorado State University. Professor Archie received his PhD from Duquesne University. His latest research focuses on methodological issues in Plato and Aristotle. Archie's the author of Politics, and Socrates is Alcibiades, a philosophical account of Plato's dialogue, Alcibiades Me. The scholarship highlights the value of classical studies and how it can give a much needed perspective on topical issues that often get discussed glibly by today's educators. Such, such issues are identity politics, race, family, and culture. Andre's engagements with classical antiquity wholeheartedly affirms its positive and civilizing values. His writings in these areas have appeared in National Review, American Conservative, and Modern Age. He's currently working on a book manuscript that's under contract with Regnery, titled The Virtue of Colorblindness, a Conservative Case for Reclaiming the Noble Racial Tradition. Today he's going to be talking on identity politics, politics and colorblind principles. Thank you, Thank you Dave. I really appreciate the invitation. I've heard so much about the presentation uh, here. Uh, I'm happy to be a part of it, and I look forward to your questions. So, as Dan mentioned, uh, this project is a part of a book manuscript uh, for Regnery. And so, you can help me work out some things, perhaps. Uh, hopefully, we have a, a lively and spirited discussion. And so, I put together some, some, some remarks that I'd like to get through. I think I've timed it uh, uh, well. And so, um, I'll go through my remarks and then uh, we'll open it up for questions. I truly believe that the United States of America is at a crossroads when it comes to race relations. As a country nearly 245 years old, we have, through fits and starts, navigated issues of race and identity, as well as could be expected given the tension brought about by our founding documents and their principles and the institution of slavery on our shores. Through it all, we stayed true to the spirit of 1776 and 1863 by recognizing individual rights, not group rights. The American project extols the individual, not the group, which means Americans intuitively know it's morally wrong to judge a person based on their care, uh, uh, to judge a person, excuse me, not based on their care, not based on their race, uh, but, but to judge a person based on their character. In other words, Americans know it's morally right to be colorblind. And recently, what's so, what's so disappointing is that there's been a weariness when it comes to race, so much so that we've been lulled and intimidated into equating the colorblind approach to race relations uh, as a type of colorblind racism, which is hard to believe. This is an unfortunate occurrence that portends a dim future for the United States if left unchecked. Like many other Americans, I was raised in a working class family that believed in hard work, Judeo-Christian values, and a good education. I was taught that the embrace of middle class values, as well as an openness towards others, would ultimately pave the way to success and happiness. I come from many generations of strivers that believed and perseverance and practice personal responsibility. Like many other African-Americans with strong, curious mothers, as the de facto head of the family, I was encouraged to appreciate new and different experiences and meet new and different people. My family wasn't naive about racial discrimination and its insidious effects, but we put discrimination in perspective. Our assumption was that the racist was too conscious of race, not colorblind enough obviously. Acts of racism wasn't an all-consuming concern for us, as it is for many of today's African-Americans and others. Although I mostly grew up among African-Americans during my formative years, a positive and open attitude for my family's colorblind outlook carried me to college, graduate school, and to another country to study abroad. I believe that the moral force of the colorblind approach to race relations must prevail in order for America and society to continue to flourish. In light of George Floyd's death and the subsequent woke forces that have swept through American society, the colorblind approach to race relations is needed now more than ever. 
These forces have convinced the elites in education and industry to accept uncritically the claim that systemic racism against African Americans infects nearly all aspects of America and its institutions. The false accusation of systemic racism has now become, has now been embraced by titans of the tech and financial industries like Facebook, Google, Goldman Sachs, Bank of America, and even establishment political figures, people like Mitt Romney have endorsed the systemic racism claim by Black Lives Matter. In this caustic environment, it's ironic that colorblindness, a once commonplace approach to race relations, is now considered heresy. The pernicious racial pedagogy spreading throughout American society in the guise of multiculturalism, Black Lives Matter movement, and critical race theory have found fertile ground in the classroom of our universities. And as an educator on a fairly large state campus, I have a front row seat to their insidious effects. The proponents of these and other racial pedagogies disdain the ultimate goals of the colorblind approach and wrongly ignore hundreds of views of ethical and religious traditions that reject assigning moral worth to an individual's prescriptive qualities. Colorblind principles are based on a rich historical struggle to rise above the natural, but base human tendency to be selfish, parochial, and tribal. Humans naturally sort themselves into groups by excluding and marginalizing others. The perverse and obscene instances in history, such as American slavery and the Holocaust, show that such exclusion never leads to anything good. Humans have the intellectual and moral ability, however, to progress beyond tribalism unless we choose to promote perverse institutional and societal incentives. Anti-colorblind pedagogy and the race consciousness that it cultivates caters to our base and natural tendencies. And it does so in the same manner as all racialist ideologies. For example, for nearly Five decades, affirmative action has encouraged racial balkanization on the part of blacks and whites and other groups. Now that affirmative action is no longer justified on the grounds that African-American slavery was unique in American history and should be acknowledged and atoned for through specific policies that benefit African-Americans, issues of identity have only grown more fraught. Affirmative action is now justified on diversity grounds which means all people of color are incentivized to balkanize along racial lines to gain preferential treatment in school admissions and employment. And so, as you probably know, is the Bakke decision, the 1978 Bakke decision, in which Justice Powell uh, really split uh, the difference. He said, well, discrimination is wrong, but race can be used as a plus factor as a factor among other factors uh, in admissions and employment. And so from that time on, we have this gradual transformation from uh, policies that specifically, starting around 1961, policy that specifically targeted the descendants of slaves in order to give them a, a leg up, presumably, or at least to make sure that they were uh, treated equally in the employment uh, sector, as well as in education. But with, with Justice Powell's decision, it's morphed into diversity. And so that's where we are today. And hopefully, the case that's coming up, or the couple of cases that are coming up uh, in the Supreme Court, uh, puts an end to it. Puts an end to it. I think it will be possible. So ultimately, the virtues of the colorblind approach to race relations isn't simply about race now and how Americans discuss it. It's ultimately about the American identity. When it comes to American race relations, the virtues of the colorblind approach shouldn't be up for debate in the public square. It should, be, it should be taken for granted. It should be taken for granted. So what does it mean to be colorblind? To be colorblind is to understand that an individual's or a group's racial membership should be irrelevant when choices are made or attitudes formed. 
In other words, the colorblind approach to race relations is grounded in the idea that the mere possession of hereditary qualities like race, sex, religion should not confer moral merit by their possession or dispossession on those who have such qualities. U.S. Supreme Court Justice John Roberts was giving voice to colorblind principles on race and racial diversity in his 2007 opinion in Parents Involved in Community Schools versus Seattle School District, when he argued that, quote, the way to stop discrimination on the basis of race is to stop discriminating on the basis of race, end quote. Not judging a person based on their skin color should be as uncontroversial and intuitive as the statement that all men are created equal. Instead, racial colorblindness is controversial, counterintuitive, and considered naive by the cultural arbiters in the left leaning academy, big tech, and corporate America. So, my goal is to rehabilitate this noble racial tradition of colorblindness and offer a much needed response to the peddlers of anti American racial ideas and theories that go against the American identity. These anti-American ideas and theories are variously known, again, as multiculturalism, anti-racist pedagogy, diversity and equity, inclusion, and critical race theory. Now, although my arguments um, are, are in promoting colorblindness, and it should appeal to the widest possible audience. I do think that conservative, conservative Americans, due to temperament and justified grievance, are my intended audience. So you may wonder, why would I direct my argument for the colorblind approach at conservative Americans? Well, considering the fact that for nearly half a century, they have been unable to neutralize an ascendant corrosive liberalism, why would I address my argument? To American conservatives. Also, it's no secret that the majority of American institutions that bestow coveted credentials or grant access to those who have them have been captured by the left. But despite all of this, despite the apparent cultural defeat, I have faith that the right arguments coupled with righteous indig indignation will position conservative Americans to make up for lost ground in the cultural world. To defend colorblind principles in these culturally turbulent times, conservatives must first reject an intellectual assumption popularized in the 19th century, and now the reigning assumption on most college campuses, especially in the United in his book on liberty, British philosopher John Stuart Mill argues that truth will emerge if competing ideas are equally entertained in the public sphere. Otherwise, according to Mill, we would be robbing the human race if these ideas are right, of the chance to exchange error for truth, and if they are wrong, of the chance to see more clearly because of the collision with error. Mill was committed to the belief that human progress is inevitable, coupled with the right sorts of institutions controlled by the right sorts of people. But nonetheless, Mill was committed to the belief that human progress is inevitable. So we can circle back around to this, but perhaps in the natural sciences, the exchange of ideas, of course, it's fruitful. But I'm not so sure, ironically, the humanities. And so as a matter of fact, the gradual triumph of good ideas or truth is not guaranteed. And certain ideas should not be allowed to gain a foothold in the public square at all. Among those who understand that ideas have consequences, conservatives in particular should be aware of the moral hazard of legitimizing certain ideas by thinking they can be defeated solely by open, and rational discussion. I sound like a person on a college campus, but I believe that's the truth. 
One such idea that conservatives failed to challenge and debunk before it took root in influential sectors and institutions of American society is the idea of anti-colored blindness. This was around 2000. Proponents of anti-colorblind pedagogy believe that the best way to navigate cultural differences in the United States is to openly discuss and highlight racial and ethnic differences. Highlighting differences of race, they argue, make explicit the structural nature of white economic and social power and how it is perpetuated at the expense of Black Americans and other people of color. Any attempt to downplay ethnic and racial differences or homogenize communities of color by offering platitudes about a supposed American identity, they argue, is seen as a pernicious form of colorblind racism. Contemporary American conservatives failed to see just how corrosive and revolutionary the anti-colorblind pedagogy is. They took it for granted that the idea of colorblindness was a bedrock notion that stood very little chance of being displaced. Legal precedent seemed to confirm conservatives' complacency. Why? Well, the legal fight against those who opposed the idea that all people are equal before the law was difficult and bloody. But the fight was believed to be just and on the right side of history. In the 1850s, the, the Frederick Douglass wing of the abolitionist movement made the case for a colorblind reading of America's founding documents. It was a slow transition for Douglass. It was a painful transition. That transition and that reading of Douglass's ultimately led to a split with the Garrisonian abolitionists who agreed ironically with Chief Justice Roger Taney's pro-slavery interpretation of the constitution. But most important, it was Lincoln's new birth of freedom and its, and its Civil War amendments that laid the conceptual groundwork for a colorblind interpretation of the founding documents. In 1896, Justice Harlan's dissenting opinion in Plessy, in, in Plessy versus Ferguson el eloquently explains the relationship between colorblind principles and the Constitution of the United States. Quote, but in view of the Constitution and the eye of the law, there is in this country no superior dominant ruling class of citizens. There is no caste here. Our Constitution is colorblind and neither knows nor tolerates classes among citizens. In respect of civil rights, all citizens are equal before the law. The homeless is the peer of the most powerful. Law regards man as man and takes no account of his surroundings or of his color when his civil rights is guaranteed by the supreme law of the land. And so nearly five decades later, the civil rights movement was pivotal, pivotal, pivotal in laying the groundwork for equal colorblind protection before the law ensuring that Black Americans not be judged by the color of their skin, but rather by the content of their character. Martin Luther, King's, uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from the Birmingham jail and his I Have a Dream speech are powerful indictments of segregation and its anti-colored blind position precisely because they appeal to the same creedal arguments, the same founding American documents and Western philosophical texts that were also used erroneously to support segregation. So it's this history that accounts for conservatives' initial complacency in confronting anti colorblind pedagogy. Given the wokeism that's running rampant in American society today, simply appealing, however, to creedal arguments to address the atavism and vitalism of anti-colorblind pedagogy and identity politics is too weak. Contrary to some on the right, identity politics is not simply ideological identities in racial, cultural, or sexual disguise. It is a response in part to the same market and cultural forces that have fragmented other ascriptive communities, family, faith communities, and ethnic communities. The over 
overriding question of those who embrace identity politics, ironically, seems to be, who am I? This question is not simply one's personal reflection within one's personal sphere, but rather it has evolved into a demand that one's identity be recognized by the powers that be and should have juridical standing, should have standing in law. College campuses are filled with this type of corrosive identity politics. Given the historical effort in getting America to live up to its colorblind principles, one would think that any attempt to divide Americans along racial and ethnic lines for the sake of fomenting racial grievances would face stiff resistance. Unfortunately, this is not the case. So what accounts for a lot of this? And where did it begin? There's one industry in particular. It undermines the idea of colorblindness the most. It's the diversity training industry. And it's the many experts it employs to further its goals. It has become the Trojan horse for far more insidious racial doctrines like critical race theory and anti-racism. The ease with which diversity training has gained wide institutional support, both on campus and off campus, has been mind boggling. The sad fact is, diversity experts have been very successful at promoting racial and ethnic conscious consciousness among their clients. The oppressor and the oppressed, that's the language that they speak, and that's what they seek to instill. Diversity training is an outgrowth of anti-colorblind pedagogy. It is intended to make white people aware of their unconscious racism towards people of color. And to lead them to accept that structural racism against black specifically is what accounts for the social disparities that afflicts these communities. Call. The training also tries to make an emotional impact on whites in order to encourage them to think sympathetically about the hard life experiences that communities of color face on a daily basis. Yes, it's quite condescending. But the true intention of current diversity training in academic and corporate settings is not to offer a genuine understanding of the lived experiences of, my, of minorities, Blacks. It's designed to promote intimidation and psychological control over a concerned but racially passive white population. There's also a self-reflective component to diversity training as well. It requires that white Americans see how the lives they live actually work against all people of color in every possible way. For example, if a white person goes to college gets a degree and a job and then buys a home in an up and coming neighborhood that's affordable. They are unwittingly contributing to systemic racism by pushing out people of color who rent in the neighborhood. As this thinking goes, the white person is racist for contributing to what? To gentrification. When the focus on racism is as elusive as systemic racism is, it is doubtful that the mandate of the diversity training experts will ever be achieved. This lack of achievement is good. It's good for the experts because it keeps them employed, but bad for society because it stokes racial consciousness and resentment. resentment. The virtue of colorblindness is that it complements individual responsibility. Martin Luther King Jr. understood the transformative power of personal responsibility and that colorblind principles complement individual responsibility. His successful efforts in fighting racism during the civil rights movement led to changes in the American political system by extending equal access to all Americans, but especially Black Americans and those who have been marginalized historically. For far too long, the American conservatives have been too willing to give a fair hearing to 
points of view and ideas that are contrary to core American beliefs. In a diverse society such as America, very few ideas or points of view have been as destructive as the anti-colored line language. To highlight the racial and ethnic differences among Americans is to devalue the unifying elements that have traditionally defined the American identity. From coast to coast, civil society has acquiesced to racial practices and policies to such an extent that we now have celebrated authors and we know who he is, in particular, writing about how babies can be racist. Even at the elite private school in New York City, Fieldston, this happened recently, the Moore School principal devised a racial equity curriculum that encouraged children to sort themselves by race so that the white children could become painfully aware of the racism that permeate historically white environments. These are children. The colorblind approach must prevail for many reasons, but the most important reason is that it is more integrated, and that's the key, it is more integrated than self-regarding identities based on race, gender, or sexual orientation, and, it, and, and, and it's more effective at promoting a sense of an American identity. Rather than acquiesce in the face of practices and social policies that balkanize Americans along racial lines, the homogenizing role that family, faith, and tradition have played and continue to play in the evolution of the country, both politically and culturally, should be promoted by conservatives. This can only be done by first recognizing that Americans should be blind to racial distinctions. I see this process of homogenizing as something awful. Black Americans would especially benefit from this homogenizing effort. As one of the oldest minority groups in America, the Black community, Black community has already debated the merits of colorblind principles versus anti-colorblind pedagogy in the fight for racial equality. The winners of that debate were the advocates of the colorblind approach to social policy and the application of law. The culmination of the approach was the social science brought to bear in the 1954 US Supreme Court decision striking down racial segregation, Brown versus Board of Education. Unfortunately, given the history of Blacks in America, it is diff difficult for some in the community to see that real racial advancement has steadily come through colorblind policies, not through intimidating. And so in a perverse turn of fate, a small but vocal segment of the African-American community and its allies have sought to undermine the racial tradition of the colonizers. So what is to be done? What is to be done? How might we fight the influence of anti-colorblind pedagogies like CRT, critical race theory? Well, I don't want to get too much into the weeds or, or throw out philosophical concepts, but I'll get a little bit into the weeds and, and try to make sense of all of this. I think we can understand colorblind principles by construing these principles within the broader context of American culture and the narratives that unite us as Americans. Americans no longer have a common ancestry, but we certainly have a common culture that goes beyond mere creedalism. America consists of a core culture animated by ideas. It has a civic, national, and cultural identity. The overriding feature of the core American culture is its Anglo-Protestant disposition. Individualism, not excessive, moral reform, religiosity, and a robust work ethic. 
Whereas conservatives emphasized a shared history and inherited rights and responsibilities in the formation of the nation state, liberals emphasize volunteerism. Now, what I mean by volunteerism is an individual's actions and relationships are freely chosen because, and this is important, because human nature is seen as malleable, infinitely flexible, and perfectible. And I think we see this today in the transgender movement. I think that's an extreme version of volunteerism. Volunteerism politically leads to seeing one's identity too as chosen and not necessarily related to that of one's fellow citizens, which leads one to identify more with members of one's class or race or one's ideological beliefs rather than feeling solidarity with fellow Americans. Such volunteerism enables the wealthy and well-connected, for example, to form networks among coastal, intellectual, or transnational elites, often at the expense of other Americans. Because conservatives correctly prefer a shared history and inherited rights and responsibilities, and liberals prefer volunteerism, conservatives must make the case that the American identity isn't simply the sum of lofty propositions and abstract creedalism. Rather, it's the product of a particular geographic location among a particular culture, among a particular people. Therefore, the role of language, religion, and culture should become the focus of public policy designed to foster a citizenry that embraces a common past and a common future. Now, I mentioned several times this idea of creedalism. And so what, what I'm sort of rehearsing is in, in Lincoln's Getty, Gettysburg Address, Lincoln says that, or he's, he calls on Americans to ground their collective identity in, in substantive ideas, constitutionalism, uh, the rule of law, and equality. And so, those ideas, that sort of creedalism, for some on the right, the Straussians and the Jaffa, uh, America is a propositional nation. It's defined by these creeds. Whereas the old right, people like Sam Francis, uh, Paul Gottfried, who's still with us, um, Wilmore Kendall, they argue that you have to couple this idea of creedalism with a particular conception of culture. And so that's what I'm advocating. I'm advocating that this creedalism is important. I think Lincoln had it right, a new birth of freedom, but that has to be grounded. Those abstract principles have to be grounded in a particular conception of what culture is, what the American identity is. And so I'm not bashing creedalism, but I'm saying it's not enough to fight identity politics, to fight this, to fight anti-colored line of pedagogy. And we can see how popular uh, these racial ideolo ideologies are. I mean, there's nothing in the public square to really uh, uh, to take them on. So, so, so the American identity, in short, isn't simply the sum of lofty propositions. Additionally, how should we understand this 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 promotion? What I'm promoting as a colorblindness. Citizens have a psychological need for membership in a particular place to particular places imbue their citizens with thick as opposed to thin identities. Thin identities have weak cultural reference points. They are not grounded in any sort of particularity. Individuals with such identities aspire to be citizens of the world, for example, but instead become citizens of nowhere. Thick identities are formed from the relationships, culture, and norms that each citizen internalizes simply by being an American. The initial formation of thick identities begins at the local level of family, neighborhoods, and community. And it is in these intimate gatherings that we develop the cultural competence needed for interpreting and understanding the world and leading a meaningful and productive life. But it's not only particularity that defines identities. 
The formation of identity also requires a broad narrative that integrates the particular home, neighborhood, and community into a country's national narrative. The simplicity and effectiveness of narratives confer a sense of naturalness on the state and its cultural particularities. National narratives can be construed broadly or narrowly. Alongside broad narratives such as George Washington and the cherry tree, where all men are created equal, narrow narratives are communicated by institutions at the local level through schools, museums, movies, books which function to disseminate the national story. National narratives need not be accurate in a strict sense. They need not be accurate in a strict sense. And they need not be noble lies. To be powerful, national narratives need most of all to appeal to the emotions and the human need to belong to something more than oneself. Just as significant, effective national narratives prevent the growth of antagonistic racial identities within the nation state, whereas weak national narratives encourage their growth. And so we have a quite weak national narrative, if we have a narrative at all, which has only made it more easy, has made it easier for these anti colorblind advocates to really dominate public spaces, especially. In conclusion, to turn away from the colorblind approach is to undermine the integrity of individual choices and personal agency by simply judging others on the basis of their skin color. The majority of people in this country for many generations have been raised to embrace American values of hard work and perseverance and the belief that education can undo many adverse circumstances one might have been born into, upward mobility, and that everyone deserves a chance and the opportunity to achieve. Most people have been raised with these ideas. Very few people grow up hearing, you're just a victim, or you're not going to make much out of your life. Few people are raised this way. So we do have a set of American values and ideas that motivate, motivate us as Americans. These ideals and these values constitute or should constitute the American identity. Americans have a tradition of judging people based on their intentions, accomplishments, and character, not their skin color, which is to say, no good can come from the rejection of colorblindness when it comes to race relations in the United States of America. Thank you very much. So we have um, we have a mixed audience, an audience um, uh, remotely, and, and an audience here. I'll try to go back and forth with, between them with, with questions. Um, for those of you, just to remind you, those of you who are joining us remotely, you scroll down to uh, the Q&A button. You can press on that and enter a question at any time. Um, why don't you start? Yeah, thank you for that. that sure. Um, so I want to drill in a little bit on the role that you see for religion in this, this shared, shared identity, because I agree with you completely that we need a stronger shared identity to have this American experiment continue to work, and that that identity has to be or can be balkanized. So we look at. Um, but I, I wonder. It seems like you think that you think that religion has to be an explicit part of that, and I I wonder. So to me, the the the, the thing that's weakest about the, the biggest weakness of whatever you want to put who you were calling focusism is that it's really unpopular, and I sort of see moderates. It's not like they learn what to do, but I, I worry that if, if, if moderates are given the choice, then you can have identity politics or no longer separate church and state. Moderates would be like, 
Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> Where's my shoes? So I'm, can you expand a little bit on what, what you're only seeing? For yeah, yeah, just real quick. So when you say, when you say that uh, wokeism or anti color blindness is, it's not popular. Among the general public, it's extremely unpopular. They can't even win primaries in Minneapolis. It includes right in candidates in Buffalo, it includes DA races in Republican in Seattle. Um, it's just not popular. It's about 80% of the country that subscribes to it. And so that eight percent is quite uh, uh, horrible. <laughs> culturally powerful, but yes. politically, politically much weaker than they think they are. Yeah. Exactly, but 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 they they're, they're sort of the purveyors of opinions, and so that's why it, it's so powerful that at least for me, and I'll get to your question. At least for me, at the university level, uh, there has to be some sort of pushback. I mean, I don't know if it will happen, but I mean, it take, needs to take place there. Um, I'm not advocating uh, uh, a particular or collapse between uh, uh, church and state. I mean, uh, I'm not motivated by those sorts of concerns. Um, I think that we can sort of glean from uh, just Judeo-Christian values um, a simple respect that we are individuals and that each of us are endowed with certain capabilities and the capacity to pursue happiness. And to me, that is sort of the basis, or at least in a very important part of the basis of, of what I call Judeo-Christian values. So I'm not sort of specifically advocating uh, for particular dogmas or uh, 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 a particular religious uh, uh, emphasis. For me, it's more sort of the general orientation of these guardrails, which uh, uh, Judeo-Christian values uh, seem to, to promise. To me, I think that that would be sufficient um, in the public square. Because again, it, it sort of appeals to the, the integrity and the autonomy that each of us are in possession of. And I think with, with, with the, the anti-colorblind approach, it, it does away with that sense of autonomy. And it sort of negates the, the inherent value and rights that we have as individuals. To me, I think that's very dangerous. And uh, again, general Judeo-Christian beliefs uh, seems to me to be adequate on that uh, in order to help us and sort of fighting back against uh, these, these color obsessed uh, advocates. Um, but I'm not advocating the collapse of uh, church and state. And I certainly think that that's for the hallmark of the country. I think we have served in the heart of that. But I do think that we need to be more tolerant of uh, certain values that, that certain people associate with. That helps. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Here's a question from um, the virtual audience. Um, what, what do you think that um, the ultimate goal of the diversity training and sort of other social practices that get that call themselves anti racist is in discounting and, and, and stigmatizing the color blind? Color blinded what, what, what their goal? What's the ultimate goal? I think their ultimate goal is twofold. I think one, it has to do with power. I really do think it's a self-serving issue. Um, even, you know, just over the last five years, even the, the, the schools that my children attend, I mean, uh, there's this bureaucracy of uh, diversity trainers, uh, and individuals that are associated with the Office of Diversity, et cetera. Now, I'm not arguing that, that diversity is bad. Of course, I'm not arguing that. But when institutions sanction, uh, who's the oppressor and who's not? This is a safe space and this is not. I think that is problematic. And I think the diversity industry um, is maintained precisely because they, they create those sort of divisions. And I think also their goal is to, as I mentioned, to promote intimidation. And it's not just 
why people being intimidated, but I think that those like myself and others who uh, push back against the racialist ideologies um, are made to feel intimidated. And I think they've been successful in a lot of instances. Uh, but I do think ultimately uh, the diversity industry, if you really push it, uh, it it's sort of a self-seeking industry and it's, it's power. It's power. Uh, I'm not sure how deeply they believe in the, 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 the diversity training, but I do think that they uh, delight in the power that they're able to exhibit uh, in these surroundings, especially at the university level. Yeah, uh, thanks so much for your talk. It was really, really great. Well, I have two questions. One uh, is just about is there, in your view, is there some place of uh, color of consciousness? Uh, for instance, you know, these different ethnic identities, Irish American. You can see racial maybe having a, a positive force. I mean, so the, I think the problem becomes, in my view, is when it, when it, it's seen as most important rather than our common humanity or our sort of, uh, our sort of civic identity. Right. And I think that I hear that part of it. So I wonder if there's any place for uh, the some color kinds, but sort of circumscribed by those more important kinds of things. And then secondly, kind of building on that last question, um, it, it seems to me that there's a number of explanations off. So I think some of it's just raw power, but there, there's other things that shall be still flexible, like guilt, because you're trying to get ahead of like guilt. Also, some of the sort of CRT stuff is like a, it's a luxury belief, it's a status symbol. I think a lot of times it's, it's used in a very classist way. Yep. So often you find Black Lives Matter signs, in very wealthy neighborhood where no Black people live. Right. And it's like, are you showing racial solidarity? You know, if you, if you have a Black Lives Matter sign and no, no Black person sees it, uh, it's kind of like, you know, uh, you know, tree, you know, falls in the forest and doesn't hear it, you know, they fall. Um, but yeah, but then the other thing is, I just think, I think the left has the colorblind idea neutralizes race, right? For, for race is tremendously politically potent. If, I mean, like, what, what Republican candidate for office hasn't been accused of racism, right? And so, uh, it's a way to sort of, you know, shore up support, but it's also, it has this sort of, so part of the power is just this, this political power. And of course, in universities, it can be used to sort of achieve a kind of left wing agenda. So it, it often is just like cudgel that's used. It's very advantageous. If you say you know, we should be colorblind, then it seems like um, you, know, you take away the cudgel, basically. That's right. That's right. Um, so, you know, so that's, those two questions, those were really sort of, uh, burning questions. I was just wondering about yeah, no, I think those are good questions. I think the first question, of course, there's a place for identity. Um, I, I, I uh, St. Patrick's Day, and I, you know, I, I celebrated, you know, I had fun, and buddy of buddy of mine in college introduced me to uh, his Jewish uh, uh, conditions. So I used to, I don't know if any of you remember the, the New York Deli that used to be. Street, but that, that was back in the day. But uh, I go there and I have conditions. And but so there's a place for uh, I love lots of ball too. There's a place for uh, 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 identity for sure. There's certainly a place for identity. And I think that to be colorblind doesn't mean that you're naive about race and the fact that certain groups, certain ethnicities have struggled. But I think it becomes a problem when, um, like you say, it sort of overshadows what makes us Americans. And it becomes divisive in terms of wanting to extract something from a group that we deem the oppressor. And I think when it comes down to it, we don't have a problem with Irish Americans or German Americans, but really it's black Americans. I mean, that's just the fact. I mean, we talk about multiculturalism and when Justice Powell talks about diversity and race can be used as a plus factor among other factors, all of that is in reaction to African Americans. Now, some of it's legitimate. The fact that initially, when affirmative action was 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 in 1961, I think it was Kennedy that first uh, uh, put forth the first executive order dealing with uh, affirmative action. It was simply to give uh, minorities, blacks in particular, uh, a fair shake in terms of interviews. But of course, that morphed over time. So I think when it comes down to it, identity is not an issue. 
really for other groups. I think Hispanics are starting to learn the language that Blacks have been speaking for, for many generations now, uh, unfortunately. Uh, but I think for the most part, it's that dynamic uh, that African Americans bring to the table. Now, I'm not saying that some of those concerns aren't legitimate, but it's gotten to the point that uh, we're, we're teaching uh, uh, young white children that they're privileged and that they have to be aware of their privilege. And when they meet someone who's, who's of color, uh, they have to put them in a box and assume that perhaps they've been victimized. And uh, that, that white child has to act in a certain way. Usually what happens, they just avoid the people of color in the class, right? That's unfortunate. Um, so I think identity isn't a problem. I don't have a problem with identity. I think it's awesome. But it's when it becomes corrosive, uh, it sort of competes with other things that we have in common. Uh, that we need to push back. Uh, the second question, um, I, think, I think you're right. I mean, virtue signaling. Virtue signaling, we, we get a lot of that. Um, I love Boulder, uh, but you get a lot of that. In places <laughs> like that, Boulder. Uh, uh, my in-laws live here. Um, and uh, uh, I think Boulder's a, a great place. But I do think that you have a lot of virtue signaling. And I think that comes with entitlement. It comes with wealth. Um, I think... Uh, there's wanting to be allies of those who are considered to be oppressed. Um, I think privilege, a lot of privilege is guilty. Uh, and so um, here's a cause that, that, that will make me feel better. So I think Shelby still is, is exactly right. Um, so I, I think that you're correct. I think this idea of virtue signaling, signaling the fact that we have these posters of Black Lives Matter in neighborhoods where, where you see very few African Americans. Uh, uh, simply suggests that. And part of me says, well, you know, perhaps these people have big hearts, you know, and they're, uh, but it's, it, it, it's become uh, it's condescending to Blacks. Uh, I think it has retarded Blacks. Um, it's starting to affect other communities of color. And so, um, yes, I, I think you're right. Yes. Okay. Um, historically, there were groups in our society that um, were not considered white, but been defined by, by the left as part of white privilege. Asians, for example. Yep. Are uh, now often not looked at um, by them as people of color, but having the same privilege as, as, as whites. Yep. Potentially, could other groups, successful Hispanics, successful African Americans, be in the future defined as white by the left? Uh, I mean, you know, I, I mean, I think there's something problematic with that. I mean, you know, because you're successful and um, I mean, Asian Americans are white, and they're, they're, they're Asian Americans. And so I think that um, it's a bit condescending. I'm not saying you are, but I'm just saying that, that way of thinking, the left, I've heard it as well. Um, I, I think it's problematic. I, I do think that um, I, I do think that for other groups, it doesn't seem as if they're as racially conscious as Black Americans are. I think uh, perhaps in certain circumstances, in certain environments, uh, they feel as if they have to talk a certain way because of of African Americans and the fact that supposedly, supposedly we're all people of color. But I think that, you know, the case uh, in California, recent affirmative action proposal was defeated. Um, the case, uh, cases uh, in New York, in which you have these selective institutions uh, like Bronx Science, uh, uh, these are public institutions, but you, you have to test to get in, right? And so Asians excel. Uh, their numbers are, are disproportionate. Uh, to their uh, their population uh, um, in the city, and so it was sort of a, a, a cognitive dissonance, you know, seeing, you know, uh, black Americans uh, versus Asians and people uh, trying to meet, well, talking about merit, and uh, one group is saying, well, these tests allow us to, to prove ourselves, and so. Um, we want to continue to do that. And then you have another group, unfortunately, saying, well, uh, that test is rigged. 
Um, but still yet, we're all people of color, so we have to be an act in unison. Um, but clearly that's, that's not uh, feasible. And I think we'll see more tension in that area. And I think uh, at least the democratic coalition back home, it's just not tenable uh, in terms of the interest of the various groups. Uh, so hopefully I answered your question. Alan? Um, Protestantism on the one hand is that American culture was derived from the liberal voluntarism on the other. And I can't think of anything more voluntary than Protestantism, right? Salvation by individual state alone is a voluntary to get. Um, and to the extent to which we want to support a certain level of Modernization and American identity in the America of 2021 that has be a Protestant identity, even if it might have been in 1800. And I just get a little bit to the to the first question, right? Which is worried about having to uh, throw out the, the separation of church and state in order to maintain a conservative America. There's, I think, a real danger in that particular retelling of American history that is what I've heard you to be promoting, preventing, in fact, that the foundation of the American identity. Uh, and I guess the, the other point is, it kind of gets to the point we've just raised now about uh, identity in general. Um, there are places where colorblindness is desirable. There are places where colorblindness is possible, and there are aspects in which it's neither possible nor desirable. I'm going to know, for example, if the person I'm talking to is a man or a woman. It's going to make differences. I cannot be blind to that. In other respects, I can be blind to that. But it's part, we all have multiple identities, and they all exist at the same time. It may well be useful for some purposes, and indeed I agree that it is. To overlook some parts of those identities, but we can't ever pretend that they don't exist. Yeah, but I never argued that. I never argued that. I mean, I think that, of course, I mean, uh, certain identities we clearly see, especially in the case of race. Um, and the, 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 the only thing that I was arguing is that um, those are legitimate cases that you've mentioned. But there are other cases, I think, that predominate now which is to automatically see certain groups of people as being exploiters and other people as being victims. I think we see that in, in schools. We see that uh, as the basis of affinity groups. I think we see that uh, in, in ethnic themed dorms. Uh, I think we see that in safe spaces. So I think it's that particular conception of identity that I find problematic. But of course, you know, there are certain medications that uh, uh, are, are ethnically targeted because certain groups suffer from certain uh, congenital issues. I mean, of course, in those situations, race uh, or ethnicity will have to be taken into account. But that's not what I'm talking about. And I think that, or at least I hope it's clear that I'm talking about uh, a version of, 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 of colorblindness that, that, that sets up a discourse that unites us as Americans, or at least points out the, the commonalities as opposed to the differences, because I think that's where uh, the, the problematic sorts of policies and issues that we're dealing with today uh, originate from. Your, your first point about Protestantism. So can you briefly, the, the version of volunteerism I was talking about is this sort of radical, uh, idea that human nature can be, uh, 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 or, or that human nature is malleable, or that human nature can be other than, uh, uh, we, we have this radical choice, and this radical choice um, allows us to sort of sever any sort of responsibilities we have within communities, even within families, uh, 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 within neighborhoods. I'm just saying that we have rights and responsibilities because we're connected with other people 
in certain environments. And so I think a radical conception of volunteerism is one in which uh, there's very little uh, feeling of obligation or commitment uh, to something uh, greater than the fact that I can simply uh, exert my will and choose uh, uh, to relocate, to choose uh, uh, to abolish this particular relationship versus that particular relationship. So I'm saying there's certain responsibilities that um, seem to be um, implied in rights and responsibilities that I don't see in this extreme version of volunteerism. And, and volunteerism also, I mean, there, there's sort of a religious component. I'm talking about the component, the component of volunteerism, which, which, which is uh, uh, the will is sort of radically uh, uh, capable of uh, sort of exerting uh, itself in the world in a way that's not tethered by any sort of causal uh, or connection or relation between the past uh, and the present. Uh, I'm saying that, that doesn't seem possible or helpful. Sort of a deracinating type of volunteers. That's not rude. I guess I put that one. Yeah. Luther, it's hard to make that face to some extent in a major universe, right? Well, Luther, um, those who did come here late voluntarily harassed So, So, what are you implying? Um, what I'm implying is that I don't think you want to see this as in quite such a stark contrast. And in fact, the nature of the America ideal is indeed. Even in its most conservative iteration, to some extent, one about yes, we can create this new country based on certain kinds of freedoms that don't exist in other places, a new identity that is not the identity that we had over across the ocean, and that this common identity we have is to some extent, and this is the classic of the world version of nationalism. A civic nationalism, a constitutional patriotism, and that in this sense, volunteerism should be celebrated as a source of a common identity and not just as a corrosive asset. Well, I think part of that's true. I mean, I, I think that, you know, it, but, but you would admit that it's not a racial identity. Oh, right. right. Yeah. And so, would you agree that uh, racial identities? Have gotten to the point where it's challenging that civic identity that you just mentioned. It, you know, yes, all kinds of, of, of racial, political, class identities have been used to challenge that common identity in ways in which I don't approve of. I'm just I'm, I'm disagreeing with your philosophical account of how we get there. Okay, okay, that's fair. That's fair. But I think we need we need more than just the civic identity. I think that. That, that was the bit about the creedalism. I think that that doesn't seem to be doing the job in terms of fighting back against uh, these other ideologies that are clearly destructive. And so if you can give me an instance in which you, you see in the public square, uh, uh, near civic identity sort of pushing back against like CRT, what would it be? I mean, the, the vote that we're just referring to, the fact that the CRT people lose elections. Now on campus they don't, that's another question, that's another problem. But out there in general America, you know, the left has a genius for choosing losing strategies, and they chose another. <laughs> yeah, Bruce. I'm, I'm... Thanks for the time. Um, can I question about what conservatives should think about Bill's uh, marketplace of ideas argument? Yeah, that's a good question. Seems like conservatives like that argument because we want to be heard, right? But we're not paying attention to the defensive side where we're letting these up, all these other crazy ideas fly under the radar, yeah, under the guise of viewpoint diversity or whatever. Right? No, exactly. It seems like you wanted to say, well, you should be paying attention to these ideas and preventing them from flourishing as much as we, we should be trying to have our ideas heard. And so, presumably, you think that's just a, a cultural matter, right? There's certain ideas that should be out of balance. This is not a kind of case against the Christian government. No, it's not a case against the person, yeah. and I and I've I've heard that. I mean, yeah. A piece of national review. Uh, I got those who argued that perhaps I was advocating censorship, yeah. uh, but I do think there should be guardrails, and I think that there are some discussions that should be out of bounds. I was I was telling a colleague. I remember back in the eighties, 
Um, I was I was on the debate team, and one topic was is, is date rate possible? Date rate possible? I don't know if you guys remember, but that was that used to be debated, and and that was that was awful, you know. And and so I think that there are certain topics that should be out of bounds by the mere fact that uh, they're wrong, they're immoral. And so I think in the case of color, anti-colorblind ideologies, I think conservatives didn't pay enough attention to the fact that it had the potential, it had the, it, 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 the ramifications of that ideology is so widespread. It's, 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 it's in sectors of society that are so influential. Even if the populace, right? So the the the, the populace might not know what CRT is. Um, perhaps it, it doesn't win elections, but it's influencing our children. It's influencing my daughter and son who are in college, and so it's it's powerful to that degree. And so, in terms of nil, I don't think it's possible or, or or wise to have all ideas in the marketplace. I think in the natural sciences, that's the case. Uh, perhaps to a degree, uh, maybe the social sciences, but I think in the humanities, uh, because its methodology is radically different from the hard sciences, I think we need to be more aware of ideas that we entertain. And I think that, again, in the case of, of, of this anti colored blind uh, way of thinking with someone like McKinney, um, the, the, the genie's out of the bottle. It's, it's, it's hard to know exactly how to push back against an ideology that, that hits kids at such a young age. Um, my own kids question in terms of, you know, there are certain things that are natural to them now because they've heard so much of it. And so um, I think we need to be aware of what Mill's saying, but I do think certain ideas perhaps shouldn't be entertained in the public square. Should we censor those ideas? Uh, go so far as to say that, but I do think that uh, conservatives are outnumbered. Uh, uh, institutions have the ability to, to sort of squash uh, certain types of discussion. And so if that's the case, then I think that we need to sort of rethink our efforts in terms of what beliefs are we going to promote? Why do I get rid of Homer? Well, he didn't quite get rid of Homer. Certain parts, right? Yeah. Right. Certain parts. Okay. So, just so one more, one more question then. The first is you said your audience is conservatives. I wonder if your audience should be moderates. Um, so other than the fact that I'm not American, I could be the representative future median voter. Yep. You know, a moderate with mixed race kids, which is a very fast growing demographic. Right. And people like me who spent the last two years, you know, looking at Minneapolis on fire and like, I don't like that. And then looking at Capitol Hill on fire and being like, I don't like that. Uh, <laughs> and, and looking at, you know, some of the, the, the narrows of college and campus and saying, well, yeah, I see that there are real problems, but, you know, I don't know that narcissistic histrionics are the solution. Uh, but I kind of think. <laughs> With the so a colorblind pitch that offers an answer to some of the problems that I think are raised by the left in a way that are clearly more effective. For example, one of the things I've done in my research is that having a shared identity is, is essential to having progressive economic policy. So it's sort of, you know, identity politics are self defeating as, as an equity strategy. In the same way, I would say, you know, right wing, this and this is a self defeating strategy that American greatness. <laughs> Uh, so, so why, why, why are is your target audience conservatives and not moderate parents? Because I think moderate parents are who gave Glenn Young and put Glenn Young in the governor mansion. Yep. And I think if you, if you get back to the, you know, the, the terrible electoral record, what you want to call the movement to push back against, I think moderate parents are the ones that are going to put them in their place, even maybe on campus where there's a lot of kind of self censoring moderates in senior leadership. Yeah, I, I I would agree with you. I would agree with you. And you know, Gregory is publishing my book. Uh, I, I'm kidding, but uh, <laughs> I'm not kidding that they're publishing it. But I mean, of course, they're being lying. So, um, but I think you give too much credit to Molly. 
Pirates haven't done much. Well, I assume it's not certain. But they haven't done much yet. In terms of, what, 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 where are the Pirates when you need them? I mean, the Glen Yonkin, I mean, I, I don't know. That's what they <laughs> are they moderates? I mean, I think the mothers were concerned with their children and what they were being taught, and the fact that uh, 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 what was his name? The guy who was happy. McAuliffe. 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 McAuliffe was so condescending towards the parents; they had no right to say what the teachers. Uh, they, they should never hear what with what the teachers were doing. So, so what I'm saying is, I, I think that moderates uh, they, they have their issues, but I'm not sure if. If they've looked at these issues broadly or comprehensively in a way that maybe someone who might be a little more partisan, of course, I hope my arguments appeal to moderates, but <laughs> moderates are moderate for a reason. I mean, they fight for their issues, but so, so what I'm saying is, it, it, how active are moderates in terms of pushing, up, pushing back? What we see. You've been there. That's that sort of what I guess the question. And then the second thing, really quickly. Is, but does that make sense? I mean, it totally does. Right? And I, I think it's a, I think it's a critique of moderates that's frankly there uh, in, in the main. The, the second question is it's true that our that American sense of identity feels like it's never been deeper. And one trend you could sort of correlate with that is the decline in religion, which maybe is, is implicitly in your sake. But the other thing you can correlate with it is. The fall of the Soviet Union and the lack of a one of the things I started out as an evolutionary biologist before becoming an economist. One of the things you know, you, the evolutionary biologist's understanding of tribalism having an outgroup is extremely helpful. Like when ET shows up, we'll all you know, <laughs> cooperate. Uh, so, to what extent could an American creed, you know, be formed by a credible geopolitical foe? Which uh, I, yeah, like I, I might have. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, we, we don't want to wish bad things, but I think yeah. after 9 11, we saw something. Absolutely. Um, I, I think that, you know, uh, with what you just referenced, I mean, I think it is real. You, you, you have, you know, they're constant. But, you know, I mean, they're in a tough neighborhood, right? So, I mean, but, but a lot of their political theorists, I'm thinking of uh, her name is Demir, uh, but she talks about nationalism in the context of, of, of having foes uh, uh, as nation states. And I think that would certainly be helpful. Um, but what would I promote? I mean, I would be more perhaps the right. would want that. I would <laughs> exactly. So I mean, uh, the Soviet Union. I'm not sure. I mean, perhaps uh, that that motivated us in terms of the sciences, um, STEM. But um, in terms of identity, I'm not sure if 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 it's completely contributed, or or we saw a stronger sense of American identity because of that. Soviet Union, I mean, but I, I think that's that's a plausible account. Um, the other thing is, I just think that we're very wealthy as a country. Um, people live radically different lives in America, um, and how, how do you break through that? I mean, you find commonality. That's the difficult part. I'm not sure about that. Um, 9-11 will ever die. But then again, who wants another 9-11? Uh, even even with, with, with COVID, I mean, in, in the beginning, everyone would say we're all in this together, but that quickly dissolved. I mean, clearly, we were not all you know, in that all together. Um, there were all sorts of different uh, demographic differences, even in terms of health, obviously. Um, so I think that's a good observation. I'm not sure if I have a clear answer. I certainly think a friend in any distinction would be important. But how do you get that? How do you get that? And, and it's ironic because I think that some in the black community, they have that. Right? So they, 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 they know the enemy. And so they're, they're able to keep the, the group together. Ralph Ellison talks a lot about this, but they're able to keep, to keep the group together. And it's been successful uh, for the most part, not for the majority of black Americans. But, but I do think there's a, there's a subset of Black Americans who, who make, they make that distinction between the friend and the oppressor uh, and the victim. But they're victimizing themselves because it, it, it just it undermines a lot of capabilities and, and capacities that uh, this community is.
to take away. The kids are not getting that message as clearly as they used to. We're not out of questions, but alas, we're out of time, um, which speaks to just 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 how um, uh, how interesting and provocative your, your talk was. So thank you. Please uh, join me in thanking Professor. Brown.